One of the world's biggest botnets just had a huge resurgence, and I'm talking about an actual botnet this time called Emotet, which is malware that takes over computers, and then they can be used for pretty much anything. They could be used as proxies for remote attacks, they could be used as pivot points for gaining access into an enterprise system, they could be used for DDoS attacks, and of course, they are used for spreading itself to other computers by taking over people's emails and then sending infected attachments that might seem legit because they appear to be coming from someone in your contacts who you actually trust. Now, this botnet malware is very different than a lot of the other kinds of malware that I've talked about before because the goal of Emotet isn't to just install some ransomware onto the victim's computer and tell them that they have to pay some Bitcoin in order to get their files back, or really to do anything that the victim would actually notice, at least at first. The goal of Emotet is simply to infect as many computers as possible and then have that malware sitting dormant in the background with an open back door to the system so that it can be taken over at any time and then be used for whatever the hacker wants to do with it. But what the puppet master of this botnet typically does is sell access to it to other hackers who would then use this compromised computers for their DDoS attacks or anything else they wanna do really. So you can think of it like botnet as a service, which is actually a really effective business model when you think about it because Malware as a service and hackers for hire, those are already really common things. It's one of the more common services that you see advertised on the dark web. Now, whether or not those services are legit is a whole different story, but most hackers out there, they don't have access to their own botnet. That's probably the number one tool that every hacker out there wishes they had was just an army of zombie computers that they could call upon at any time to do whatever they wanted. And a hacker developing their own botnet is one of the more difficult things for them to do because it requires compromising so many machines and then maintaining that access, maintaining that control over the machines because the whatever you use to get into the system could potentially be patched by a system update or it could be removed by somebody who finds the back door that the botnet created. It could be removed by somebody formatting their system or resetting it for whatever reason. So now instead of different hacker groups having to spend years and years forming their own botnets to use, they can just hit up Emotet and they can pay them some Bitcoin or Monero and then rent out as many machines as they need. And since November, this malware has compromised approximately 130,000 machines across 179 countries, more than enough for any aspiring hacker to rent out. Now you're probably wondering, how do 130,000 machines all over the world get compromised and remain compromised long enough for them to be rented out to various hacker groups? Did the developers of Emotet find some new attack vector or take advantage of a complicated zero day vulnerability? No, no, not at all. They just used the oldest trick in the book, sending emails with document attachments that request the end user to enable macros. That's right, the thing that literally every single person who is knowledgeable about computers has been telling you for years not to do is still the primary way that people get malware onto other people's machines. And it's not like these emails are highly targeted. The people that are running Emotet are not gathering a ton of intel on people to conduct spear phishing attacks. They just send something generic like this, hey, have a great day, and then <laughs> there's an Excel document with macros attached to it. So this should be your first red flag. Now, when you open up the document, you still haven't been pwned yet because Windows doesn't run macros by default. And that's why the documents look like this when you open them. Instead of something that actually looks like an Excel sheet with data in the tables, you just have this big, bold message that tells you that the document's only available for desktop or laptop versions of Excel, and you must click enable editing from the yellow bar above. So they're just really trying to encourage you to open that up. I can tell you this, I've worked with a lot of Excel documents that have macros on them, and 
I've never seen one that just looks like this. There's usually some kind of information that is in the Excel document, and then you just have to run the macros to generate some more information. And we see the same thing with the Word doc. So instead of showing you a preview of the document, it tells you previews are not available for protected documents. You have to enable editing and enable content to preview the document, which doesn't even make any sense. Why would I need editing turned on just to preview a doc. And if it's a protected document, wouldn't that mean you don't want me to edit it? But you see, this is how social engineering works. If someone is dumb enough to just open the document in the first place, then I guess they're probably not putting that much thought into this message and thinking about whether it makes logical sense. Now, the computer is not compromised until you actually click this enable content button. But once you do that, the macro runs this PowerShell command, which then downloads a malicious DLL from a random website, which the hackers previously compromised, and they're just using it to serve those DLLs, which contains the actual malware payload. Now, even though sending Word documents with malicious macros is an old yet effective method of delivering malware, it's the kind of thing that once it's pointed out to people, like if the IT department emails everyone in the organization or they hold a meeting where they say, stop enabling macros on random Word docs that you're not sure about, then there's a good chance that that method of infection isn't going to work, at least for a week or two. So recently, they switched up their method of delivery. They're still using email, but now, instead of sending an infected Word doc, they send a zip file, which contains a .lnk file, aka a shortcut pretending to be a document. And usually it's called something like receipt or W2, usually something to do with taxes or finance. So maybe there's a little bit of social engineering going on there. You know, taxes were due recently, so maybe people have a little bit of urgency around files like that. Now, you might be familiar with desktop shortcuts, those programs that you have on your desktop. Well, they aren't actually the programs themselves. They're just links that point to a program somewhere on your system. This is why you could delete a shortcut, but it doesn't actually remove the program from your system. And this shortcut will then execute a PowerShell script, which again, downloads the actual malicious payload from a random website that the hackers have compromised and they are using to host their malware. And then the machine gets added to the botnet, waiting to get rented out to some hackers that might use your computer to mine crypto, run ransomware, maybe look at you through the webcam. I'm sure that the botnet master really doesn't ultimately care what people are doing with this botnet, as long as they pay up. So now that you're sufficiently freaked out over this super potent new strain of malware and probably running your antivirus, trying to see if you have it on your system and see if you can remove it, let's talk about some ways that you can protect yourself from something like this. And I hate to break it to you, but antivirus isn't actually gonna be able to do much against this kind of malware or really any new kind of malware that shows up and is developed by a script kitty because all malware these days is polymorphic. Its code gets refactored automatically every time it's sent out. So the signature of these files are always going to be different. You might have one sample of the malware that matches a known signature or it's close enough and Windows Defender and your antivirus is then going to catch it. But another sample, it might look totally clean blacklisting websites. So trying to just block the sites that host these DLLs because that initial macro that you run or that initial shortcut that you're clicking on that runs the PowerShell script, that by itself isn't affecting your machine, right? The payload is being downloaded. But the problem is that these hackers are compromising so many websites. And in actuality, they might not even be compromising the sites themselves. There's an entire economy that goes on with black hat hacking where you have some people that are experts in taking over websites, they're experts in taking over web apps and then getting control over the box that is hosting that web app. And then they will sell that control to somebody like Emotet, which wants to distribute malware. So just like any other industry, black, black hat hacking, it has this entire economy that's built around it. 
And there's so many of these websites that are being compromised and that are being added to this list of sites that could host malware every single day that there's no way you'd be able to block that with some kind of a website blacklist or firewall or anything like that. So defense against malware like Emotet, it really depends on you and you have to keep yourself safe. And the way to do that for the millionth time is to stop downloading attachments from random suspicious emails. Think twice about it, okay? Phishing emails like this that aren't targeted, the hackers, they don't know your name, they don't have any personal info to really use against you to try to gain some additional trust. These kinds of emails depend on you having no skepticism around emails like this. So always check who is it from. Check the headers of the email. Is this email from who you think it really is? Or is it somebody who's pretending to be a company or the government or somebody like that? Read what's in the body. And if the hackers are doing some kind of social engineering, one typical trick is to try to create a sense of urgency like, this is from the IRS, you must open this form and you must fill it out immediately or you'll be arrested. First of all, the IRS would never send you an email like that. But if you're not sure, maybe you're panicking because you know you're committing tax fraud and you think that the jig is up, go ahead and call them. Just, just call the IRS, contact them in some way to verify before opening up a shady attachment. It's perfectly normal and businesses are not going to mind you checking with them. In fact, most of the time businesses won't even send you attachments anyway because they realize that it's a serious problem. It's a way that hackers use to infect people. So they typically just try to keep things in text uh, as much as they can. Now, even if you download the files from this attachment, you still haven't been compromised. It's not over until you actually open the file, or in the case of the Word docs, you have to open the file and then enable macros. So you can see why they moved to using the infected link method because that just requires one action, just double clicking it and opening it instead of the two actions. So before you ever open any kind of file, make sure you know what you're actually about to open. If it looks like a doc file, if it has that thumbnail, that preview image of a doc file, that's something that can be spoofed on any type of file. So you can't just trust what the icon is. You should actually go into the properties and check it out, okay? If it's actually a shortcut that's pretending to be a doc file, you shouldn't open that. If the shortcuts target location is system 32 and the target field looks like complete gibberish, like something like this, you shouldn't open that. Right click a file and look at its properties. It's not going to harm your computer in any way. It's not going to execute by you right clicking it and then looking at the properties. So double check before you double click. Like and comment, attack the algorithm. Follow me on Odyssey. Have a great day.